Our next presenter teaches upper level science lab classes here at Illinois. On her website, joannelovesscience.com, she presents science in whimsical and unexpected yet meaningful ways. Tonight, she will play the part of a time-traveling beauty who can visit any scientist she desires, who will be in her little black book of scientists she loves. Here to let us in on her secrets, please welcome Joanne Manister. Okay. Oh, all right. Science has indeed validated the phenomenon of beer goggles, which makes things that are normally unattractive seem much more attractive after you've had a few drinks. And I'm going to use this to my advantage because I'm talking about science. So as I was introduced, my name is Joanne. I definitely love science. But I would like to send a shout out today to Matt Coakley, the art director for Popular Science Magazine. He helped me design my slide. Here is Al. He's so serene and so intelligent. His family immigrated from Poland. He wanted a great science education, so he took a train from San Francisco to visit President Grant and ask for a non-existent spot at the U.S. Naval Academy. President Grant gave it to him, and this was a good move because he won America's first Nobel Prize. He did this in an experiment with his pal Ed, where they were trying to decide if light travels through the ether wind and they determined ether wind does not exist, being the world's most famous failed science experiment. <laughs> Here's my darling Paul. He spent most of his early career looking through microscopes at tissues, much like I do, and he discovered these discrete regions within the pancreas that we now know secrete insulin and other hormones. Now he thought that this had an immune function, so he was a little bit wrong, but his name is attached to this structure. He contracted tuberculosis from all the dissection he had done, so he left Germany in search of a cure. He turned his study to marine worms and meteorology. He goes to show you can have correct observations but incorrect inferences, and who needs a Nobel Prize when your name is attached to something? Here's Marie. Isn't she hot? And by hot, of course, I mean radioactive. She's also hot because she's the first woman to ever win a Nobel Prize and the first person ever to win two Nobel Prizes in science. She won her first Nobel Prize with her husband, Pierre, for their discovery of radioactivity. And after Pierre was killed in a freak accident where he stepped in front of a carriage on the street, she continued her work and discovered more radioactive elements and was then awarded her Nobel Prize in chemistry. Ultimately, she did fall ill from all the radioactivity she worked with. Here's Enrico, warm and friendly, and he's a rare mixture of theoretician and experimentalist, which means he's a great thinker and good with his hands. He's Italian, you know. So he won his Nobel Prize in physics for his work with induced radiation, and we know him best for creating the first nuclear chain reaction, which occurred under the University of Chicago football field. That technology was needed in order to create the first atomic bomb, which means that we need to carefully decide what we do with any technology we design. Oh, whoops, Pierce, what is he doing here? As my daughter would say, oh, he's so pretty. Pierce is not a scientist, but I found this ad in a French public consumption science magazine, so I'll overlook the small flaw that he really doesn't have a degree in any sort of science. Here is Ramon. He is the father of neuroscience, and actually I should say godfather because his personality was so compelling. He too spent a lot of time in front of the microscope, and he drew these wonderful images of what neurons look like and how they interact with each other. For this work, he won a Nobel Prize in Medicine, which he shared with Camillo Golgi. And Golgi and Ramon were bitter rivals, and in fact, their Nobel Prize speeches directly contradicted each other. Ramon was also quite the artist, a portrait taker, and he wrote science fiction stories under the name of Dr. Bacteria. Here's Fair Lisa, because when it comes to science, 
Gender doesn't matter. Although, in this case, it did, as did her religion. So even though she was seminal in our understanding of nuclear fission and wrote many papers on the topic, she was glaringly overlooked for a Nobel Prize. She had a 30-year collaboration with Otto Hahn, and she and her staff were kept safe from the harmful effects of radiation because she was so meticulous in cleaning measures so she could prevent external factors from entering into her research. C'est Claude, he's the world's preeminent physiologist. He helped us understand the role of the pancreas in digestion, the role of glycogen in the liver, and many other things. And despite the horror of being a vivisectionist, the way he did his experiments truly furthered our understanding of physiology. He once said to me, quite charmingly, as the French often do, la fixité du milieu intérieur est la condition d'une vie libre et indépendante. The French can sound so romantic, especially when they're discussing how the body keeps itself in balance. We call that homeostasis, by the way. He was a big proponent of the blind study, really one of the first people to advocate this. And he was one of the first scientists to lay out exactly how scientists should go about their work so it can be validated and repeated and understood by future scientists. Here's Michael. I still pine after him to this day. He was a great experimentalist without having much of a mathematical bent, which is a lot like I am. He isolated the compound benzene, and his work with the magnetic lines of force eventually led him to create the electric motor. His extraordinary clarity in explaining concepts and his desire to share science led him to create an annual Christmas Children's Science Show, which is still held to this day in London. And this just goes to show, if you love science, you should share it with the world. Thank you.